Amen. Amen. Guess what? He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. 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 Would you tell three of we got so many wonderful guests with us this morning and people we haven't seen for a while. Would you just reach out to them and tell them you love them? And more than that, he loves them. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's do that.
Jesus said, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and ever. He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never go thirsty. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd, he lays down his life for his sheep. Yeah. 
sentenced him to die. When the crowd had heard the news, they shouted, crucify. Crowned with thorns, they mocked his name and nailed him to a cross. He hung there till his dying breath. Day one, all of doubt and fear take hold day two disciples hide day three his body's missing the stone was rolled away the angel of the Lord appeared when the woman came Trembling out of fear and joy Amazed at what they find They quickly run to spread the word They pray he is alive
for us to, to intervene here. Let's turn into hymn number 268, Our God Reigns. Let's all stand. 268. Sixty-nine. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. He You know, last Sunday, oh, they were shouting to him. Oh, yeah, Hosanna to the highest. But by Friday, they were saying, we've been mistaken. He isn't who we thought he was. Crucify him. Put an end to it. Even his disciples, the ones that he thought had his back, some of them denied him. Some of them
them betrayed him. And by the time he said it is finished on the cross, every one of them had lost their faith and walked away from him. But guess what? This morning, the tomb is empty. He lives. He lives. And he is Lord. He is risen from the dead. And he is Lord. And every knee shall bow. And every one of our tongues need to confess that he is Lord. Troy, let's sing that one more time. And let's sing it with joy in our hearts this morning. He is risen. And so he has taken away the doubts. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. He has risen from the dead, and He is Lord. I know this is Easter, and I know many of you have got a lot of things that you're going to do today, and so I'm not going to preach very long, but I just want to share just two or three real things with you. But before we do this morning, we had a precious lady in our community passed away yesterday, and, and uh, I want you to be aware of it, Brooks Walker, the mother of John Way Walker, please lift that family up in prayer. It's difficult at any time, but especially at a time like Easter. So please be much in prayer for that family. If you will, turn with me this morning to the Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, James, John. I'm just checking on to see whether you're with me or not. John, the 20th chapter. You know, yesterday here we had an Easter egg hunt and many had Easter egg hunts everywhere and some are probably going to have some today. And I even know that Easter egg hunts can get you in trouble. I asked Carl this morning, I know he went to an Easter egg hunt yesterday where they were going to have some money hid in some eggs. He told me he was taking a great big bushel basket to hope, but it didn't do him much good. He got... What did you say, $5? But that didn't bother him. What bothered him is that Betty just cleaned up, and she won't share with him. She won't share with him, and that's, that's the part. <laughs> but let me, let me just, an observation about Easter egg hunt. Have you ever thought about this? An Easter egg hunt, you don't hide eggs from your kids. You hide them for the kids. Now, how many of us as parents sometimes hide things from our kids? Right? 
But that has a totally different motive than hiding things for them, isn't it? Totally different motive. And as I thought about that statement, the difference between hiding from and hiding for, I thought, you know, that's also true in our relationship with God. And a lot of the times when we think God is hiding things from us, in reality, he's hiding things for us because they can make us stronger and they can make us have blessings that we, we didn't even believe was possible. This morning, as we look at this 20th chapter, It starts out the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene comes early, and it was dark. And she see the stone taken away from the sepulcher. And she runs and comes to Simon Peter and to the other disciple that Jesus loved and said unto him, They have taken them away the Lord out of the sepulcher. And we not, do not know where they have laid him. I want us to think about that for a moment. When Jesus died on the cross, his body was taken down. Joseph of Arimathea owned a tomb, and he asked permission to take the body of Jesus and put it in his tomb. That's not much different than it is today. We go out here to Lancaster Cemetery and we see Alvin out there and we buy lots to use for our family in the future, don't we? And so it was not any different then. Joseph owned that tomb and so he took Jesus and he took his body and he put it there in the tomb. And then I want you to notice that Once the tomb, he was put in the tomb, they rolled this huge stone in front of it. Now, to get an idea, this wasn't just a rock. Many people believe that this rock, this stone, probably weighed as much as two ton, probably 4,000 pounds. And then when they got the tomb, stone roll there that wasn't enough they totally sealed the tomb so that nobody or nothing could get in they weren't worried about anything getting out they were only worried about something getting in and so they totally sealed it and then I want you to notice the scripture says that the Roman army put a guard there. Now, when we see that word guard, we think he put a soldier there. No, the word guard in the Roman army meant it was a group, 12 to 15 men. And these 12 to 15 men were put there with one job. You make sure That nobody, nobody bothers that tomb. Because if they do, and you let it happen, you will die. Now that's how strong their job was. Now Curtis, if they'd set you there and said, Yeah, you make sure that nobody gets here, or else I'm going to kill you, you will die too. You're probably not going to sit down and take a nap. Right? You're going to be watching to see what's happening. You're going to make sure that nobody comes in there, nobody bothers anything, nobody destroys anything, that that tomb is going to be solid. I heard a story about a lady that did not believe in God. 
And people, a lot of her friends kept trying to witness to her and kept trying to preach to her and kept trying to tell her that the day will come when all of us will come out of our graves. Some of us will go to heaven. Some of us will go to hell. But we will come out. And she, Rick, was not determined, was determined that was not going to happen. And so she bought a mausoleum. And she got left orders that when she died, she was to be put in that mausoleum. And there were iron gates put on there. And she wanted chains galore put on that to make sure that nobody could ever get in that mausoleum and that she could never come out. But Rick, an interesting thing happened. A bird one day dropped a little seed on the ground right underneath the corner of where the gates were. And that little seed took root and grew into a tree. And as it began to grow, it began to grow right up through those hinges on those gates. And guess what happened? After a while, as the tree grew, it burst those hinges all to pieces. You say, oh, that's impossible. Have you ever been walking down a sidewalk that's about that thick? And all of a sudden, there's a great big crack across that sidewalk. And you think, what in the world could have broken that sidewalk? And you get to looking, and over there about 20 feet is a tree. And that tree roots have come across. And a tree root that you could take your pocket knife and cut to pieces as it grew underneath that concrete sidewalk and got bigger and bigger. What happened? It burst that concrete sidewalk in two. And so I don't care how much they tried to seal that rock that day, that, that huge stone that day. When God got ready for the stone to be rolled away, it was rolled away. Now I want you to notice something this morning. I don't believe that God rolled away the stone so that Jesus could get out. I believe Jesus could have come out anyway. He rolled the stone away so that the disciples that came could get in. He wanted them to be able to come in and see that he wasn't there. That his son was gone. Now when they walked in, they noticed a couple things. One, they noticed that the burial clothes that he had on was wadded up and thrown at the place where he'd been laid. But they also noticed, and it's recorded in Scripture, that the napkin that typically they lay over the face of a dead person, that that napkin was folded up and laying perfect on the table. Why would that be? Because it was custom in that day that if you were in a home and you were having a big meal, like today you're at Jennifer's house and you're going to eat a big meal, and is that what's going to happen today? No? You doubt it. Well, if you're at Jennifer's house and you're still hungry, but you've got to get up and go to the bathroom, what you do, one of two things you can either take that napkin and just lay it down. And that means I'm done. But if you fold it up and lay it there, it means I'll be back. So you want to fold it up and say, Jennifer, whenever you get the rest of it on the table, I'll be back. <laughs> it may be tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, but I'll be back. 
okay? Jesus had folded up that napkin and laid it there with a message. I'll be back. I'll be back. And folks, I want you to know that as sure as I am convinced that the tomb is empty today, I am also convinced that he is coming back again. Amen. He is coming back again. Now, a lot of people don't want to believe the resurrection of Jesus. But can I just say to you this morning that there's only three things that could have happened to him. Think about it. The first thing that could have happened is that the enemies, whether they be the Pharisees or Satan himself, they could have went in and stole the body. But if that were the case, when Christianity began and those Christians were having great days and people by the thousands were being converted, if that were the case, they would have brought that body out and said, no, you're all a bunch of liars because here he is. Right? They wouldn't have kept him hid. If they had his body, they would have brought him. The second thing that could have happened is that the disciples could have taken him, his followers. But let me tell you why I don't think that happened. Because if you read what happened to every one of those disciples, all but John, who lived to be an old man on the Isle of Patmos and wrote so much of the last of the New Testament, every one of those disciples died horrendous deaths of punishment. Now let me ask you a question. Would you die the death of punishment if you had stolen the body? No. You only would do that if you believed that he was resurrected. And so that leaves only the third possibility. If somebody didn't steal his body, then the only other possibility is that it happened just the way God's word says it happened. And he is risen today. I choose to believe that. Now there have been many books and many sermons written about the seven words of Jesus while he was on the cross. But this morning in this 20th chapter of John, I want to talk about the seven words of Jesus after he came out of the grave, after he came forth. Start with verse 15. Jesus said unto her, Woman, why are you weeping? Now think about that. If we've just lost somebody that we love dearly, it's normal for us to weep, isn't it? In fact, the Bible says that even Jesus wept. Right? But why would he make that statement to her? Woman, why are you weeping? I think he's trying to get across the point to her. Hey. You haven't got anything else to weep for. It's been taken care of. I'm alive. I'm alive. And I think the point that he makes even to you and I today is that I don't care what kind of a struggle you're going through. I don't care what kind of a temptation you're going through. I don't care what kind of a problem you're going through. It don't matter how big it is, how small it is, how unbelievable it is Jesus wants you to know this morning you don't need to weep you need to put your faith and your trust in him and you can have victory over everything don't sit around weeping Christians 
We need to quit weeping. And we need to start rejoicing and praising God. Jesus looked at her and he said, woman, quit your weeping. Why are you weeping? And folks, I think that's an important lesson for us today. If we're a Christian, we need to live victoriously. Trust God and rejoice. Then look in the 16th verse. He said, Mary, the resurrected Christ knew her by name. He knew her by name. I've got good news for you this morning. He knows you by name. He knows you this morning. He knows you personally better than you even know yourself. Because nothing is hid from him. He knows it all. Third, look in the 17th verse. He said, go tell my brethren. That's a message to the church today. If we believe today that he is risen, then we need to get out of here and go tell people that he is risen. Go tell my brethren. He's alive. Get excited about that. Then look at verses 19 through 21. In the end of the 19th verse, he says, Peace be unto you. Listen, folks. God does not want you to live in turmoil. God does not want you to live this kind of a life. God wants you to have peace. He wants you to have peace. Jerry, not the peace that the world can give, but the peace that only he can give. That's what he wants you to have. Peace be unto you. Look at verses 21 through 23. We find the fifth one. He says, As my Father has sent me, so send I you. What's he saying there? Noah? God sent me here to earth because he had a job for me to do. That's why I was born in a, sta- in a manger, in a stable. But the purpose was not to be born in the manger. The purpose was to die on Calvary. He sent me with a purpose. Now I'm giving you a purpose. In the same way that God sent me, I'm telling you to get going (laughs) and start telling the story. And then he said, and there's an only way that you can tell the story is if you receive the Holy Spirit. He said, receive the Holy Ghost. Folks, if you and I are not doing what we really ought to be doing, it could be because we've not allowed ourselves to be filled with His Spirit. He wants us to realize that every one of us in this room, I don't care if you're three years old or if you're 30 years old or if you're 90 years old, every one of us have a job to do. Then look in the 27th verse. He comes upon Thomas, who wouldn't believe. And he looks at Thomas and he said, reach hither. In other words, 
put your finger in those holes and you'll know that they're mine. You'll know who I am. Believe it. Reach hither. And I think that message is for us yet today too. Jeff, I believe the message is yet for us today. We're to start reaching out. Quit walking around with our hands under our arms. We're to reach out. Reach hither. Reach out to people. Help people. Present the gospel of love to people. He finishes that by saying, be not faithless, but be believing. In other words, live a life that people see that there's something different in you. We sing that song, because he lives, I can live. We need to start acting that way. And then in the 29th verse, oh, those precious words. He said, blessed are those who have not seen me and have believed. He said, it's one thing, disciples, because you've met with me here in the room and you know that I'm risen. And you've stuck your hand in my side or had the opportunity to. And you've seen the nail scars in my hands. And you've seen the places on my forehead. And you've seen all that. But more blessed are the people in the Lancaster Church of the Nazarene, Easter Sunday, 2017, that have not seen me face to face, but are willing to say, I believe. I believe. I've not seen. But I'm trusting him. And I believe. I believe. My question to you this morning, where are you going to allow God to live in your life? Will you let him be first? You see, it's so easy for us to get caught up in our lives that we have good intentions, but he's not first. Folks, let me encourage you this morning by telling you he needs to be first. He needs to be first. Where do you spend your time? Where do you spend your energy? I pray that you put him first in your time and in your energy. William Gladstone was four times prime minister of Britain. And he made this statement. Tell me what the young men of England are doing on Sunday morning. And I will tell you what the future of England will be like. I believe that fits America today. Where will we be on Sunday morning? It tells a lot about where the future of America is going. Amen. Amen. Troy, come lead us. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation this morning. And on this wonderful, wonderful Easter day, this day that he has risen, oh, as we sing this song, I want you to remember that the reason that we are saved today, the reason that we can be saved and know that our future is secure is because he was willing to go to the cross and shed his blood in our place. And when we make commitments here at the church, when we're baptized, you're not making commitments to me. You're not making commitments to the church. You're making commitments to God. Be careful the commitments you make. And we need to make sure that we've got our relationship right. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, but you'd like to know him today, oh, why don't come and let me have a word of prayer with you and show you how that's so easy and so possible. Whatever the need is in your life, may God meet it today.